Thank you, Michael, for that uh, warm introduction. I don't know if it's more daunting to speak to quite a few people or to many. Because if it's <laughs> many people, this <laughs> I've I've done a lot of public speaking, but if it's a crowd, it's like people kind of disappear. But you know, when you sit in a little in a little group at the office, and and you know your turn is, is coming, I get nervous. Eh? I now what shall I say and. I will start sweating and all of that. But in any case, um, one of the best conferences I ever did, it was a local one, it was here in Sandton, but there were eight people in the audience, five of us were speakers, okay? <laughs> However, I met the two most amazing business contacts possibly in my life on that day. So, and I know this is being streamed and it, others will see it, but it doesn't matter, you know? It's sometimes if you can just help or change somebody's mind or in the questions they, thank you, they change your mind because sometimes you'll ask something and I'll go, well, I've never thought of that. That is quite interesting. So for me, it's also about learning. But yes, Michael, we've been doing exciting things. Um, when I first spoke with Michael, I said, listen, there are so many people in South Africa doing phenomenal work in this space. Societal good in particular, education, uh, healthcare. Um, it's not just all Silicon Valley in Northern America or Europe. The challenge, though, is that very few of those people are known or know about each other. So what we've tried to do, and I think quite successfully, Michael, is to give a platform to those people. And I just wish, and I'm going to touch on some of that today, that from a societal and a business and a government point of view, we do so much more together using this technology, which is a gift. We'll most likely screw it up, knowing human nature, okay? But it's a gift to answer so many of the ills in our own society. Um, so, yes, yeah, also first time in two years that I'm actually speaking to people that I can see. Last year I did 31 virtual conferences. It's quite nice because I just put on a nicer looking shirt. Obviously the shorts stay on, of course. Nicer looking shirt, but I don't see anyone. I have no idea how it's going or whatever. It's actually quite, that is really quite daunting. I would like to start off with a, um, just a story. Um, and in the 1930s, one of the best economists that the Soviet Union had was tasked by Stalin to go and investigate Western capitalist societies and economies. And the goal of this was to determine why the Soviet system and communism was the better system. Because in the Western world, and obviously it happens all over the world, but you have these cycles, you have these bubbles and bursts, um, and all of these problems, I mean, if you think of the Great Depression, if you think of the Wall Street collapse, even back in those times, was proof to Stalin that the Soviet way of living is better. So this guy went and he did his research for a number of months. <laughs> and, you know, it's like when you work for a very narcissistic boss who will not take anything but what he or she wanted you to say. So uh, Nikolai Kondratiev, if I pronounce, I always struggle with his name. Some of you might know him. He went back to Stalin in the 1930s and said, in fact, my academic research shows that the capitalist way of, of living, as imperfect, obviously, as it is, is by far better than the communist way. He was a few weeks later shipped off to the gulag and died. But he wrote a letter to his daughter uh, not long before, or he started realizing I'm in trouble now and they're going to come knock on my door. And, and, it's, and I'm going to paraphrase it terribly, but if you read up on this, it's a beautiful story. Um, her name is Elena, and I think she was eight or nine at the time. And he basically said to her, he said things like, listen to your mother, always be a good girl, read as many books as you can, and please fondly remember your papa. Something like that. It's so emotional for me. You know? Why am I talking about him? Because he, he came up with these so-called K-waves these 50 to 60 year cycles, uh, creative destruction, some might call it. And we know a lot of people make a lot of money in the, those kind of crashes or down, downward spirals. But these spirals are um, driven by technological advance. You know, we speak about the fourth industrial revolution, which is actually a real horrible way to talk about it. Um, one of my favorite authors, Dr. Jacques Ludic, he, I'm sure he was maybe not the, the originator of this term, he speaks about the smart technology era which I think is better. We still live in the second industrial revolution here in South Africa because we're trying to keep the lights on. You know, we've got this huge digital divide. So um, when we had that presidential commission on the fourth industrial revolution October a year ago, they did 
wonderful work. What's happened after that? And now the question is, um, is it now for, up to us as society, is it up to business to implement these recommendations? Because there are some really great recommendations. Or do we stand back and wait for government? And I think we can't wait for government. We need government, of course. There are some very exciting initiatives in government. There are some people who are very knowledgeable about this topic. If we think of the likes of the CSIR and, and, and others. But I would say the weight of what we need to do in our country to really make change, if we think of the future of our children, it's so huge that it can't just be a few smart people in government that understands this technology. You know? So this really one of my passion, passions is to take this almost disparate ecosystem of all these people doing great things and to really try and get people together a lot more. So this, we are now in the so-called sixth cycle. Um, that Kon Kondratiev spoke about. And we know all about it from the smart technology or fourth industrial revolution point of view. Machines that are becoming smarter than we are. What it means to be smart is a very philosophical conversation. Even intelligence is an interesting conversation. Maybe the one point I would leave with you guys today in the short time that I have is that the rate of change is so much faster than we can imagine. I'm definitely more an optimist than a pessimist. But we can't just be optimistic about this technology. I mean, it's already infusing all our lives. I would often, at a conference like this, I would say, how many of you have used artificial intelligence today? In fact, let me ask you, if you've used artificial intelligence today, please put up your hand. OK? How many people have smartphones? OK, we all use artificial intelligence every day. It's, it's behind the scenes of almost all the applications on our smartphones, and not just our smartphones, some, sometimes even our alarm systems. Some people have smart fridges that auto orders milk and stuff like that. But it's definitely no longer in the realm of science fiction. Our everyday lives, to one extent or another, is infused by this kind of technology. So that's what I want to leave you with, is don't fear it, but my goodness, it's here. And it's changing very quickly. And unless we work together to regulate this, it's going to go run amok. So just to quickly touch on, um, and I had busy slides, sorry for that, but, and, and again, please can I have a four-hour slot to do this talk? <laughs> but just, and some of the speakers spoke about this today, and this is in my consulting work with customers, because I, I work a lot in the smart automation space, robotic process automation, intelligent automation. A lot of customers will start the conversation with, we want to get rid of people, can you help us automate? And firstly, it is stupid from a business point of view, and it's ethically wrong, especially in our country where I don't know what the stats are, but I guess on average, every wage earner looks after five or six or seven other people. So if the, if the return on investment is so-called FTE reduction, that's not a good business strategy. And what I then tell the clients, but so as an example, you've got 100 people now. Yes, through efficiencies, through automation, through better data, dashboards and the like, you most likely only need 80 people to do that same job. And then the, the business case is obviously getting rid of the 20. And then I say, but have you got no plans to grow in the future whatsoever? Well, if the answer is no, then why are you in business? So the business case is rather keep the 100. And when you need 120, you keep the 100 because they are now empowered. They have efficiencies, et cetera. So think of it as a, from a growth point of view. Now, I guess if you are chairperson of a board or the MD or whatever, and you've got huge pressure from your investors and you have to hit your numbers, it becomes a very difficult conversation. But the first point I want to make, and I'm still not even in my slides really yet, is, is starting with people. It's a people first initiative, automation, or any other kind of technological um, uh, initiative that you go on. People first, supported by technology. It's almost always the other way around, okay. And the same here, start, before we even look at any of these initiatives, start so with people, but with ethical and philosophical issues. You know that the two biggest jobs in the future of this technology is not, or the most needed jobs, important jobs, not AI engineers, data scientists, and the likes. It's ethicists and philosophers. And the reason is we're opening up cans of worms with this technology. Think of designer babies. Think of brain implants, which I'm going to touch on. Think of the future of democracy. Um, think of what we see happening in China. We have to, from an ethical point of view, but more importantly, from a philosophical point of view, think about this technology. You know, if, if my brain is uploaded to the cloud, 
or if my thinking is not really me anymore because I get signals from the outside. If half my body is not really flesh anymore because it's 3D printed body parts and the like, what, am I still human? And what then does it mean to be human? If, if you, you know, the soul or consciousness even is a very debatable concept, but I do think that's something that makes us different from mammals, other mammals. You know, I've got, I've got consciousness so I can remember the past. It leads to regret for most of us. I can think of the future. It leads to fear. My dog, when I feed her too much, she's going to lie there like a happy puppy. I promise you she didn't spend this whole day worrying about her budget or the things she said to somebody yesterday or if she's beautiful enough. But I am more evolved, and look, if I look at most humans, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know if we are all that much evolved, but we definitely are. But so the nature of being human, of humanness, is going to change with this technology at a very rapid scale. And then, and I'm going to go through this quickly so I can get to the slides. The government's legislation and the like, responsible AI, which is some work that I'm doing currently. It's a lot of organizations in South Africa now waking up to this concept of responsible AI. What does that mean? Number four is where I really want to spend the four hours. You know, the invasive technologies of the future, and then just maybe to end it off, this fact that it's a collective and a societal response. Okay. You also see my slides. I, I once had a lecturer that says you should never have more than 14 words in a slide. And it's sometimes difficult depending on what you're presenting. But I'd rather have pictures. The reason I have pictures is because then I can remember what I wanted to say, not just to make it better for you to look at. Okay. But look at this picture. I mean, for us who are parents or for most of us, I mean, just that sacredness of humanity, of the beauty of an innocent young baby, of, of young people. Think of your frail... Um, Parents, perhaps, I mean, the fact that we need to look after each other as a collective is such an important point. So this ethical agreement of what are we doing with this technology and the philosophy behind it should be the basis of this whole conversation. We, and I'm, I'm going to jump forward a bit, but if, you know, I work with customers who say we want to implement a responsible AI framework. And then I will say, to do what? And that's normally where the meeting becomes a little bit weird. For that matter, I often get invited to have a talk on robotic process automation and AI with, with boards or with managers. And I always say, to do what? And then they say, but we've read and we saw the Gartner reports and we went to a conference and it's going to fix our whole process. You know? and, and I have fixed more problems with, with API calls and Excel sheets than with AI. In fact, in the last three years, only one customer that started off with we need AI ended up in an AI implementation. Most of it was we don't understand our jobs, we don't know how to work together, our ways of working is broken, our basic processes are broken. And, the, and, and I worked for a bank a few years ago, and I'm sure most people who worked for, or work for banks can say this, I don't know how they open their doors every morning. Of course, the processes were so broken, the way people understood what their jobs were about. So before we jump on this AI exciting bandwagon, let's just go back to the basics from a business point of view. And there are some businesses locally that's doing incredible work in this space, utilizing AI, machine learning, and IoT, and all those things. But start with the why, almost a Simon Sinek kind of conversation. Okay, why are we trying to do this? Now, so just to sum up this slide, we cannot overestimate the importance of the impact on humanity more than ever before. Um, I think it's, is it Yuval Harari? You referenced him earlier, Michael. Who's, yeah, it is him. I think it's in Sapiens, where he speaks about us creating the so-called useless class. Interesting phrase. So we know that through every so-called industrial revolution, the net job gains eventually was positive. Because we could always upskill people. We could upskill um, horse cart drivers to train drivers, for instance, etc. We're now in the first time in our history in an industrial revolution where we cannot upskill people and we cannot upskill them fast enough. Almost all jobs will be automated. Now you can say plumbers, definitely caregivers, most likely not. A big part of what they do could be automated, you know, through predictive analytics, how they work with their patients, for instance. But most blue, white collar, whatever you want to call it, jobs are very automatable already. So what do we do when we have people, most people on earth, who cannot upskill themselves? Because even if you're upskilling yourself now already, it is a, something you need to do every year. It's not, I'm going to pivot my career to become a data scientist. I'm going to 
do a three-month course or whatever. Because what are you going to do in a year from then? Because then the technology has changed already. So it's this continuous upskilling and changing. Definitely our tertiary, well, across the world, but in our country, our tertiary, even our secondary education is not even nearly ready for this. The lecturers and the teachers themselves don't understand this kind of technology. So what of a plumber then? What of a doctor? What of a, a, an accountant? AI might not replace that role, but AI might replace the people in that role who doesn't understand how to work with AI. Should you become a computer engineer, data scientist? Not. Think of this. One of my good friends, Catherine Malerba at, at Tuckies, she's a breast cancer researcher. And they've, they've got an amazing um, nonprofit. They go to rural areas where they do a lot of education about this because it's a very misunderstood thing. Also, prostate. Um, but they've got a handheld device with which they can do the scans. You don't need all this expensive equipment. And through, through machine learning algorithms through the cloud, they can give a almost 100% accurate diagnosis immediately to that person. And then that person can take all that data and then look for, for medical care, et cetera. So and that kind, those kind of topics really excite me. All right, but let me move on. because I can really go on a tangent with this. We've had some interesting talks today about this topic the use of our personal data, and the question I asked earlier, because I've been grappling with this, is my face my personal data, the way I look? Strokes, you can even, there's some security companies I've worked with that you don't need a password to log in, you need to type a phrase, for instance, because we all type in a very specific way almost like micro-expressions in the face, but you've got a different way you use different fingers as you type. It's personally identifiable. So from a security point of view, it can be great. But what if you can hack the way I type, and, and not only my sentiments, my language and stuff, because I think that we can do pretty easy if we see people's writing, but you can also mimic the exact way I type, not just the way I look, the way I walk, and things like that. So we really need our governments across the world to regulate this. The challenge is that balance between regulation and innovation. It'll constantly, constantly be a, a big problem. But because this is becoming such an important topic, we need a lot more done by our governments. We've got POPIA. It's a good start. GDPR. But I don't know if I'm wrong if I'm saying this. I'm not aware of any legislation, even in the works around this stuff, about what you really can do with my data. Yes, you have to protect my privacy. It, it doesn't have, it, it can't be identifiable and so forth. But, you know, what about the Googles of the world and the Facebooks? Because most of all of our data is in the custody of one or two big companies in the world. And we've got no power over them. They're like nation states by themselves in a way. So how are you going to sue Google? Imagine that. Right? We've got a few billion in the bank. Not in Randa, Rands, I hope, by the way. But we really need to work with our governments. In South Africa, 60% of government workers do not know how to use a computer. There was that incident where our vice president was asked in parliament just even a year or two ago, what is the fourth industrial revolution? And he struggled because most people will struggle to explain it. So we really need to work with, with our legislators to understand the kind of laws we need in this field. It's not just government. We need to put some sort of pressure, some sort of influence. Do we need something really wrong? To happen before people will wake up. Will our government ever worry about this? I don't know, but I don't think it's, it's a sign that we should sit still and do nothing. Maybe we need to auto of sorts for this kind of topic, to influence and to make noise and to, I mean, I think they're doing pretty good work in any case. Um, let me just pr bring it back to business. As I said earlier, a lot of businesses are now talking about this. A lot of them are still grappling with AI, not always getting it right, um, the reason we had this conversation earlier, the, the single reason for me why AI initiatives fail is because business leaders don't understand it. It's not the technology, it's not the technology department, it's often the use cases or the reason why we're implementing it, because it's a tick box often. When I worked for this bank, I worked for one of our big, big global vendors would fly our CIO to Silicon Valley once a year, and then they would go and meet Google and Facebook and Alibaba and everything. And then I remember the one year he came back. Now, this is a 110-year-old bank, 40,000 people. And they just sent one email and said, from now on, we're going to work like Spotify. 
So you, you know, the tribes and guilds and all that it just took us a while to figure out where you fit in that whole thing, you know. But you can't just slap a Spotify or a, or a Google's way of working on any organization, especially not big old ones, old ways of working, not old people. Because the, another interesting topic is how do we digitize the immense experience and skills that we have in people who, who've been with the company for a long time. Why do we still force people to retire at age 60, which is young these days? You know, that's, but how can we take everything they've learned, digitize it, and help new young people coming up the ranks to learn in a year or two, if possible, I don't know, what that person might have learned over 30 or 40 years? Is it the brain knack or something like that? So, so there are some very specific frameworks from a business point of view. We've heard a lot about biases and our data. We know that facial recognition is maybe the biggest example of this. It cannot still today accurately identify darker skin faces or female faces. And I say tongue in cheek because it's a bunch of white guys in Silicon Valley that creates this technology. One of the speakers alluded to this, that we need a lot more diversity in our teams that develop this technology. Gender diversity, age diversity, and ethnicity diversity. Because we all have biases. You know, it's not because people mean it in a bad way. There's just things we don't see because we're human. So we need people who speak a different language, who's from a different area in the world. So for instance, it, I mean, I don't know that much about um, the Muslim faith, for instance. I know enough. I've read the Quran, been to mosque, and all those things. I'm very interested in these topics. But if we say Somalia, for instance, or some, or Saudi, where there are very specific rules around the place of women in the, in the world or in the workforce. It's easy for, for us here or people in America to write algorithms about how female staff should be treated, as an example. But we don't have a clue. Even the females in those rooms might not have a clue because we don't know what those societies are like. So those kind of projects will fail. It might actually lead to even more prejudice as an example. So, so the, con the consulting I do with businesses is what are you wanting to use AI for? Because that's already a cost saving. You've most likely got the technology that can do what you want to do in any case without AI. But then the way you use both your internal operating data, your staff data, but especially the data of your customers. And we harvest a heck of a lot of data from our customers these days. What do we do with that data? And it's not just about the storing it safely and all those very important things. But think of if, the, if there's biases in the bank's data about your home loan application. So I might just live three or four blocks from somebody else with the exact same credit score as me, pretty much the same income, and all of those things. But just because we are, he, is, he or me for that matter, on the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak, the algorithms might not give the same kind of interest rate. One thing about finance, and what about access to healthcare? What about if algorithms decide how quickly you can be admitted to hospital? What kind of care you can get and how much you're going to pay? And there are biases in it. So um, we have a lot of companies who's not really touching our lives. It's not like I'm going to die if they do something wrong. But think of Netcare as an example, Hospital Group, you know, Medicross, or those companies. Think of our banks and so forth. They have to have a very robust framework to use this kind of technology to make sure there are no biases in the, as far as possible. The data is, is securely saved and so forth. We're still going to see huge penalties in this area. It's like, and Michael, you referred to it. We haven't had a big PR fiasco yet. Whether, you know, say a bank gets sued 100 billion rand or something, I don't even know if that'll solve the problem. But maybe even in this space, a really big screw up, but can we afford the cost? Because again, if it is 1,500 people couldn't get to the hospital quickly enough because of the biases, then what, and they died, then what penalty is that? Yeah, we can give their families money, but people died. So this, this is how important this stuff is. It's not just the fun of the tech and so forth. This is our everyday lives and especially the lives of our children. This is really what I wanted to get to. I mentioned facial recognition, the, the biases in this technology. Like with all technology, double-edged sword. Facial recognition incredibly effective at, uh, at security, to some extent policing, but we've seen in the US as a good example, uh, you know, the very wrongful arrests there. But I mean, I, most of the customers I go to these days, I have to let them take a picture of my face so that they can track me where I go in the building because there are cameras everywhere. 
is even if I go to an area that I'm allowed to go because the access card opens for me, but I shouldn't be there as an example, you can also see who people are associating with. In, so if I say I came to meet Michael and they let me in, he comes and fetches me at the turnstiles, where else do I go and who else do I speak with? There are some good business reasons for tracking those kind of things. But now think of your societal impact. You know, um, think of what China is doing with this social scoring. And that is going to be rolled out. Look, firstly, China is colonizing the world, especially the third world, developing world, in my opinion. But this technology, I think, will really be rolled out everywhere. Simply, what is the social scoring? It is that, firstly, they're tracked pretty much everywhere, where, especially in the main cities. Anything you do or buy is based on your face. So you can't buy things if you don't look at the camera, as an example. But now what if the, the, the um, Communist Party realizes that you are a potential threat? Or what if you're just a criminal for that matter? Obviously your social scoring is, is, is impacted. So can I still buy food? Can I still buy food at the same price? Can I still go, can I enter normal public buildings that any, anyone should be able to so that societal control, and it brings me back to Orwell, you know, um, and man, yeah, I should read Orwell if you haven't yet, because he was so, even though, you know, his book 1984 was a lot focused on the Soviet era, but, you know, he wrote things like, and, and he wrote 1984 in 1948, but he, he wrote, he said, what if the TV I'm watching is watching me back? Unthinkable for many, many years. Most of our TVs have cameras in it now. It's great when you do gaming because you can see your movements, you play tennis and all of that. It's great because there's no more movement, so it switches off. But we are living in a world where we are constantly watched already, constantly listened to. How many of you have had Facebook or Google ads about a topic you spoke about with a friend yesterday? And then Facebook says, no, we're not listening. It happens so well, it happens to me a lot when I see some heads nodding. Imagine industrial espionage. Are we going to get to a place, I think we should, where your board directors, well, even if it's a virtual call, because in a virtual call we all still have our phones next to us, but we're going to go to board meetings where we're going to have a locker for our phones because we don't know who's listening while we're having the board meeting. Not just state-sponsored actors. I mean, the Chinese can do it, the Russians definitely can do it for The NSA is definitely no angel. We don't know who's listening. But what if um, your competitors rent the Russians to, to listen to every one of your board meetings, as an example. Now, so these are things we need to think about. Um, so social scoring. Brain-computer interface is, I often say, you know, if you think of how technology has evolved, we used to sit in front of our computers. You had to be there at the desk. Then these things, these mobile phones became smart. So now I can take well, like a smarter computer than I've ever had in my whole life in my pocket with me wherever I go. The next step is wearables. Most of us have them. So it, it reads my um, temperature, my heart rate. You get some really smart phones that can read all kinds of other things about your body. So from being at the computer to carrying it in your hand to carrying it in your body to having it in our brains. Neuralink, Elon Musk, they've done a lot of tests on monkeys. This year they're going to implant a probe into a human brain for the first time, pending approval. Now think of the health benefits, brain stem injuries, Alzheimer's and the like. Again, that double-edged sword. It can really improve the lives of people with so many problems in their brain stem and their brain injuries and so forth. I guess it could even increase intelligence. Then we should implant it in everybody, I think. Okay. But the, what's the dark side of that is, of course, privacy. So you can send me signals that will influence how I think. Now, democracy, democracy is already under threat because if we think of our social media feeds and then how it gives us the info we actually want, to build on the biases we already have through the algorithms. We saw what happened in the, what's the 2016 election in the US. This is gonna happen, keep on happening across the world. Democracy is the engineering of consent. And we used to do it through political rallies and through obviously like signs on the side of the road and stuff. But now, again, this thing that I wear in my hand or that I wear in my body is constantly amplifying my, my views, my biases and the like. But what if you can not only read what I think, but you can totally influence it? 
So this is no scary stuff. And back to what I said earlier, am I then still really a human? If the most private part of me, my thoughts, are no longer private. And not, not just that, it's not even my thoughts. It's thoughts that some algorithm is sending me. You know, so and our children will have this in there. We most likely will have it as well in a few years, but this is going to be the world our children live in. The Neuralink implant, for instance, is done with the local anesthetic, or anesthesia, whatever you call it. It's not, a, it's not surgery. It's about the width of a human hair. So and it's almost non-invasive in a way. But what the, the, the power of what that chip can do is incredible. It's already there. Thank you, South African-born Pretoria boys, hi, Elon Musk, <laughs> for this. But look, if he's not going to do it, somebody else is going to do it. But um, So this whole responsible AI thing is, and again, it's, that's the message I want to land in, in a very short time, and I hope I'm doing it okay. Wake up, people. Not in a scary way, not in a totally dystopian way. R benefit from this technology as far as you can for your business, for your family, for your health, and all of that. But the kind of world our children will inhabit, I would say about 2050 or so, will most likely be totally dystopian. No privacy, no thoughts of my own anymore, watched everywhere where I go, uh, totally controlled, and part of the useless class because there are no more jobs. Will that happen? I don't know. Most likely, I think it will. So what can we do? We, and this comes back to my last slide here. We all have some sort of influence, some sort of network. And I'm not saying let's go and toy toy and get things, but use your influence, use your networks. Firstly, learn about this technology. There are some fantastic books and YouTube videos. I'm not a technical person. I don't really care about the algorithms and stuff. It's the most boring. I will not watch those videos. I like Novella Rari stuff and, and some of the others, these societal impact philosophical conversations. But at least know the basics of what this technology is. When somebody says Internet of Things, edge computing, facial recognition, understand the basics. Read a bit. Take the responsibility to educate yourself and, and map it to your interest. You might love history. I do. There's a lot of good stuff about history and this kind of technology. You start with where I, what I spoke about in the beginning. It might be philosophy, religion, many, many other things. Um, I've just written a piece for, a, for another publication on the future of religion with artificial intelligence. Huge philosophical topic. I'm not going to go into that, but think of this. In our evolutionary history, we, when we developed consciousness, we lived in a world where there's thunderstorms and our, and our crops are destroyed and stuff, so there must be something bigger than us, more important than us. There must be more to this life than just dying. So we started burying people in fetus position because there's a new life waiting for them. Now there's again something that's all-powerful, all-present, that knows everything called artificial intelligence. There's already a church of AI in America, believe it or not, okay? Look, a lot of churches and mosques and, 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 and shuls already use this tech, but yeah, I'm going off topic here. But if it impacts how I think, imagine how it impacts our spirituality. I've got about eight minutes or so left. It feels like I've, doing, I've been doing a mind map in my head, and I don't know if it made any sense, but I will leave it there for if there are any questions or comments, uh, Michael. Yeah, thanks. I think there's just so much for everyone to be taking in uh, because it really was, uh, and, and you touched on some of the big themes and technologies mm. and how they relate to the big ethical, philosophical questions. But I want to bring it back to the South African context just for a second. So you're sitting around a boardroom table at one of the big banks, for example, being very mindful of the context in which South Africa finds itself. Last July, we had civil unrest. We've shared... 2 million jobs in the private sector through, mm. through COVID, uh, about 400,000 in the government sector, give or take a few. Not many of them have come back. Yet you need to remain globally competitive. So you've got, to, you've got to strike this balance between getting more out of your workforce through robotic process automation, for example, and also being mindful of your operating context, which, as you said in your first slide, is about being mindful of the community. How... How are you having those conversations with the clients that you consult to? And how are they thinking about this? Because it's a, it's, you know, you've got shareholders that are putting pressure on you. I mean, it's, it's a, a bit of a Gordian knot from where I'm sitting. How do you untangle that? 
It's a good question because it's so easy to theorize about this. And what do we do as consultants typically? We go and tell them what they already know and we charge them 100,000 rand for that hour or whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if I'm that CEO or MD or whatever, that business leader, and, and it could be small businesses as well, or, but especially of your big ones. Think of banking that's usually uh, uh, very regulated, uh, unionized, because the topic of automation is a, a very dangerous topic in banking more so than in other areas. But now I've got shareholder pressure, I've got KPIs, um, I also need to survive because my competitors are doing so many incredible things with this um, technology. I will lie if I say I know exactly what to tell them, oh, Michael. Because if I was in, in that seat, and if I had a bit of um, an ethical ability and a bit of a care for people, because if I didn't, then let's just use technology and just get rid of people. You most likely won't just be able to do that, but you might get away with some of it. So how do we look after our people but also through innovation, make sure they still have a job next year because we didn't fall behind all the other banks or whatever. So I, I try and bring it down to a human conversation with the technology, but and, and then look at rather small areas where we can make big changes, get some cadence, but you can't just digitize and revolutionize your whole organization. I don't think, maybe in, in time, but what are the two or three kind of job functions that can really benefit from automation? So an example is I, I dealt with a, a big hospital group, not the one I mentioned earlier, <laughs> about automation. And um, obviously being admitted to hospital is, a, is quite a manual thing. You know, yeah, sometimes these days you can pre-register on an app or whatever, but it's still you go to the desk. Apart from all the COVID tests and all those things, it's, it, you know, it's a mission and checking your medical aid. And, it, if, and if you're in pain, it's even worse because you just want to die and you're going to spend two hours filling in forms. But they wanted to um, automate and digitize that whole front office experience, which is such a great candidate for that kind of technology. And in the meeting, and I do tend to have these statements where everyone's weird and quiet, and I said, because they, they drew their whole plan of automation workflows and stuff, and if we use this kind of tech year and blah, blah, blah. I said, did you, did you actually speak to any of these front office staff members about what would make their lives better? And they didn't. So firstly, you're not going to take those people on the journey with you because they're going to naturally all fear losing their jobs. But they know stuff, and back to one of the comments I made, to digitize years and years of wisdom and experience if you can. Those people know things about the business. That's why I like that undercover boss kind of TV program. Everyone sits here in our ivory tower in the boardroom discussing this thing. You don't have a clue about what's going to impact those people's lives. And they will have ideas that will totally change the way we think about these things. I want to tell one story and then I'm done on this. There are more questions anyone. Years ago, I worked for a company. Remember when the big black boxes came in? M-Web's big black boxes, the first real modems we had. Remember, what was it, 14.4 and, and, and like 10 o'clock at night, you wake up and think, I wonder if I switch the modem off because the telephone line is still running. Okay. <laughs> that feels like the previous millennium, which it was. But I worked for a company that imported these modems and we packaged it and distributed it for M-Web. And I was about 24, uh, I was the product manager of that product, and my boss invited me to a meeting our company's execs and the execs of MWeb. And he said to me, you're gonna learn a lot, but you keep your mouth shut. I was like, okay. And the whole, the whole meeting was about how can they sell modems online, okay? And they had like a 22 million rand um, budget around the marketing and all, like, and there's all these smart MBA people. I mean, I'm 24, I still don't really know all much more than I did then, I think. <laughs> But eventually I thought, I just can't keep my mouth shut anymore. And I put up my hand and my boss gave me that look. And the chairperson said to me, Johan, what do you want to say? And I said, and I really thought I'm going to be laughed out of the room or kicked out. I said, if people don't, or if people are not on the internet already, how are they going to buy a modem? I mean, it's so stupid. <laughs> how do you sell modems online? So yeah, so they were quiet for about five minutes and they said, no, we have to change our whole strategy. Okay, so PT here in the room had a better idea than all these execs. So think of all the PTs, it's a horrible way to say it, but the, the people doing the actual jobs, they have better ideas about how their jobs could be changed by automation. Be excited about it, not fear losing their jobs. But just maybe to round it up, Michael, it's a difficult question to answer. It's not black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, but 
I, I think what you've done in responding to that question is is articulate some of the complexities in it, and and hopefully, you know, boards are grappling with it in that same way, mm. uh, and are not just taking the easy option of saying right, you know, it's a, it's a it's a race to the bottom. Certainly reminds me of what Nick Benadel said when he was lecturing at Gibbs to a room full of banking MBAs, and he said, you know, everyone's wants to compete to be the biggest bank uh, in South Africa and is uh, blissfully unaware of the context. And if you're not, just look north of our uh, borders, north of Limpopo, and see mm. you might be competing to be the biggest bank in a failed state, in That's which case uh, you're really competing for the biggest of nothing. Mm. So, you know, we have to be mindful yeah. of those. Uh, is, it, is it time for one more? One more question? Okay. Yeah, oh, we've got yes, two sir. minutes. Uh, thanks for, for the Uh, you've got a big voice. I heard you earlier, so don't worry about the mic. <laughs> no, there it's on. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think for me, and and you have um, uh, touched touched about talk about it a bit. Um, is the role uh, of, of government um, uh, in terms of the regulation? Was um, a lot of this, um, um, and we, we spoke about it off record that a lot of these um, um, AI systems. Um, uh, off-shelf systems that we're getting from somewhere else and we wherever they're coming from um, th th there's already a case where um, um, they have been questioned like the facial recognition system that we have already talked about that in the USA most of these systems are already um, uh, 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 identifying black people as criminals or not even recognize them in the system and all those kind of things. And these systems, we are already bringing them on our side. So the question is, um, um, and from your interactions with, with uh, most of the leaders out there, that is there um, uh, an appreciation of, of the impact uh, of these um, 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 uh, systems, and and whether the, the the government and the regulators are are, are in sync with with the, with the reality of how these things can end up impacting the site itself. It's a really good question, and the unfortunate answer is not at all. I think on a government level and a business leadership level. So the example we spoke about earlier is that um, one of our ports of entry, they they and I'll just give not enough information so people know, but they wanted to implement this American facial recognition system. But in our ports of entry, 98% of people are not Caucasian. And this, so there was no due diligence, I think. So imagine now if, it's one thing if you live in other countries where the, the split is, is kind of more equal, but in our country, most people are black. Hence the facial recognition will think most of them need to be arrested. Imagine what that will do to the port of entry, apart from just how ethically wrong it is and all that. So the due diligence, but the problem is that, and I work for a big consulting firm, but these consulting firms come in, they promise the world, they've got so, all these shiny things, and I think decision makers often don't really do their own research. They just think this is great. And even if you say the risk lies with your provider, the impact on your organization, I don't know if you can determine that risk or really mitigate that risk, if it destroys the lives of people, for instance, you know. So I don't think people grapple with this enough or know enough about it to grapple about it. So with it. So I hope that was beneficial. I hope you liked it this late in the afternoon. It's almost whiskey time. Michael, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I'd say a warm round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.